In this section of the training, we're going to be talking about cameras and a little bit later on we'll be talking about camera placement. But first of all, we really need to find out where the cameras are, what they are, how they work, what they do. Okay, so if I want to place a camera in my scene, I'm going to go to my Create tab. I'm then going to go to Geometry and a little bit further along here, I've got Cameras. So I'll click on that icon and you can see we've got cameras here, we've got two types. And from the drop down here, we've only got standard types of cameras. So there's only really one type of camera in 3D Studio Max. That's the standard type, but it comes in two flavors, the target and the free. So we'll start by looking at the free camera. It's this one over here, and I'll click on free camera. And you can see we've got a few presets that we can create here. Um, really, before I start creating that camera within the scene, I, I'm not that worried about what these are. I'm going to come back and change them later on anyway. So all I'm going to do is to click in my viewport. Now, this is a free camera, uh, and that means that you can point it wherever you want. But it also means that if I just left click once, you can see I've placed it there in the front viewport, but if I place, click once here in the left viewport, I place it pointing in another direction, and if I place one here in the perspective view, it points down. So do bear that in mind that when you're placing these cameras and you're putting them in your scenes, that as we pointed out earlier on in the training, the viewport that you place these cameras in will depend upon what direction they're pointing in. If I now go to rotate, and I'll make sure this is set to world rotation. And I can also go to move, and I'll make sure that's set to world move. I can pull this camera up, and I can rotate, and I'll go into my single mode from full view mode. And with my angle snap turned on, I'll just rotate this up 90 degrees. There we go. So you can see the way that this works, this camera works, is I rotate the camera itself. Yep. Now I've got my angle snap on, so I'm snapping to five degree increments at the moment. If I were to turn that off, turn this back. if I was to press A and turn that angle snap off, I'd obviously get a much smoother rotation. And of course it doesn't really matter any of that because if I press auto key and I go to frame 40, and then I start to rotate, you'll see that that's created a nice smooth movement anyway. So it, you know, whether I've got the angle snap on or not doesn't really matter too much. If I want to scale the camera, I can do, but it's not really going to affect anything particularly within the camera. Um, you, you do get problems if you start to scale target cameras. Um, we, we'll talk about those in a little, in a little moment's time. Um, but it doesn't really, it just changes this thing here called the view frustrum. Now, you can see we've got the icon for the camera, and you'll also notice that this icon doesn't change. If I, what I mean by change, it doesn't change in size as I zoom in and out. Yeah, It's quite a literal icon. Got two little rolls of film there, and a camera, and a, and a projector front to it. And then we've got this rectangle out here. And that's called, as I mentioned earlier, uh, just a moment ago, the view frustrum. Basically, anything inside this cone, the camera will be able to see. Now, it can obviously see past the cone, but for example, if I was to place an object just here, where my cursor is, um, the, the, the camera just wouldn't see it. Okay. So if we just prove that, if I come down here and I move things like that, and I will put one of my most marvelous teapots in this scene. So there you go, there's teapot. Make a couple of changes to that. There we go. And I'm just going to delete these two cameras as well so they don't get in our way. And then I'll come back to my full view mode. You'll notice that by default, we're not viewing through a camera. Okay, so I need to change one of these views to be my camera view. So what I'll do is I'll pick my left hand view and I'll click on the word left and I'll go to cameras and I've got camera 03 because that was the third camera. And you can now see that this is what that camera is viewing. And if I take my camera and I move it left, my object moves right and so on and so forth. So I can, if I want to, then rotate this camera down a couple of degrees and it just shows the teapot more in the middle of the screen. 
One thing that I really need to do now is before we start getting into these options over here is to talk about the other type of camera that we've got, which is a target camera. Now a target camera is somewhat different in that if I create the camera, I left click to create the camera and then I drag out its target or point of interest as some programs call it. And the difference here is that if I move let's just press G, if I move this camera around, you can see here, it's always pointing at that target there. If I pick the target up and I move that, it always points at the target. So I can do one or two things. And what's really great about this type of camera is if I place it next to that object and if I use one of my options over here which is forward link and I click on it and then I select the target you see I've got a little um, little stretchy rubber band here and I drop that over the top of the teapot now whenever I take that teapot and move it the camera you can see is always pointing at it so that's incredibly useful whereas our camera here which was our free camera which is great for, for stills, uh, doesn't follow the camera. I mean, if I was to link that to the camera, it's to the, to the object itself, and then I move the object, you can see it's following it around. But what I would see from my camera, even though we know that this camera is moving around all over the place, or that the teapot rather is moving all around all over the place, you can see the camera, what's seen through the camera doesn't seem to move at all, does it? Not at all. So a couple of differences there that are worth noting. However, no matter which camera I choose, whether it's the whether it's the target camera or whether it's the free camera, they both have this set of options that you can see here in my modify panel. So we'll discuss those briefly now. The first set of options is I can manually by hand change the size of lens and the field of view that I'm using. Now, really I might not want to do that um, because, I tell you I'm going to do camera here, I'm going to make this camera, right, there we go, so we're now looking through this camera here within this viewport. Um, I might not want to do that, I mean it, it, yes there's always going to be the case when I want a specific size lens, but to be honest with you, we see the world through a 35mm, which is this stock lens here, let me just move forward. I'll explain about the movement for the, the icons down here in a moment as well. We see the world through a 35mm lens, which is what this is. If you want to take a portrait shot or something, say you're doing a product shot, you might want to pick a 50 or an 85mm lens. And I'll dolly the camera back to fit that in. And you can see that's a little bit flatter. Yeah, there's not as much perspective as you would find with a 35mm lens and an 85 Obviously we've got zooms, so we can zoom in, and you really do get with this a feel that you're you're actually zoomed in, that you're looking at something from quite a distance. And it's because you've got this kind of foreshortening happening and this flattening of your object when it's created as an image. If I was doing an architectural render and it was going to be an outside view, I'd pick a 35mm camera, most likely, possibly even a 50mm. If I'm doing an interior shot, I might go down as low as 20 millimeters. Yeah. Um, when we come to look at uh, one of our scenes with the inside in a minute, we'll probably look at um, how we place the cameras uh, a little bit later on when we come to do rendering. And I'm sure that we'll be using something as low as a 20 millimeter camera uh, in order to sort of be able to view everything inside the room correctly. Looking just below that, uh, what you'll see below this section here, what you'll see is we've got a, we can change our camera from being a target to a free camera. So if you create a free camera by mistake, uh, you can always change it to be a target camera, which is useful. We've got a thing here called show cone, uh, and that's the, the view cone here. And really what that means is that when the camera is disabled, or, or unselected rather, normally you don't get to see the, the, the viewing cone or the, the view frustrum. Here, with that switched on, I will do. I've also got something here called Show Horizon. Now you can see that doesn't necessarily show up here immediately, but if I select my camera viewport and I use my orbit camera mode, as I come down, can you see that what we've got is 
a black line. And it's that black line that really sort of defines where your horizon is, okay? Incredibly useful for camera matching. You would be surprised the number of professionals who start off by saying, yes, we're going to start camera matching, blah, 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 and do this, that, and the other, and then really just rely on this one black line in order to, to line up their photographs correctly. It's quite surprising. It's incredibly useful and a great cheat. Another thing we've got here is our environment ranges. Let me see if I pull this back. Um, what I've got is this dark line. That's my far environment range. Uh, if I, my near range is right actually at the camera. If I was to, you can see there's a yellow line appearing. And what I'll do is I'll just, there we go. So this is my near and my far environment range. Now these are used when you create fog. Okay, so what you would do is you would attach fog to the camera and you would give it a near value and a far value. And the near value of say 10% fog would mean that between the camera here and this near range there, you would only have a 10% fogging. And then say your far range is 100%. So that means that between this range and that range, you go from 10% to 100%. And then everything beyond that is 100%. Very, very useful if you're doing underwater scenes and you want things to seem as if they're appearing to, you know, they look as if they're appearing to appear from the, the murky depths, uh, what you can do is you can put an environment range close together like that. So everything from here to there will be maybe 15, 20% fog, and then everything afterwards will be 100. And what you've got is a little band here where your object, your shark or something, would come swimming into, into view and would then be visible, and then it would maybe swim out of view as well. So quite useful, but we don't need them all the time. The other thing that we can do here is something called clip manually. I've got a near clip plane, and I'll, again, I'll push that forward a little bit. Just do that there. You can see that there's the two red boxes, okay? Now, unlike a real world camera, unlike a real world camera, a CG camera can be told, do not include anything in between the camera and this start range here and then do not include anything beyond that far range so only elements which are contained within the near and the far clip plane will be included in my digital photograph and you can see that's true here because right in front of that camera we've got the teapot and we can't see it in this viewport if I move that back so that the camera sits inside of the clipping planes you can see it's now visible I clip and I go forward, you can see we can actually start to cut through that, that object. There you go. Pretty much I want to take that off because I want to, obviously, you want your camera in CG to simulate what's going on in the real world. But you can kind of help yourself out a little bit by saying, well, actually, I'm going to discard everything after this point, or I'm going to not have anything included before this point. So I could say clip manually. And if we come here, and I'm going to dolly the camera in, there we go. I could help myself out a little bit by saying, well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'll bring that near clip plane back in there, and I'm going to take my far clip plane, and I'm going to do that. And that's going to be the only thing that my camera is going to render. In which case, uh, I'm going to really save myself a lot of effort if I've got a big scene. Of course, I won't get the rest of the scene in, but I will save myself a lot of time in the render. I'm going to turn that off. Multi-pass effects are for depth of field and for motion blur as well. I wouldn't counsel doing either of these inside a 3, 3D package. Um, depth of field is where you get that effect where something is blurred slightly towards the back. A motion blur is where you have um, something that looks like it's turning around very quickly. To be honest, um, about sort of um, depth of field and motion blur, really you want to be doing that in post-production. Um, po that's really what post-production is there for, is for doing those types of effects. It's what the professionals would do. It's very fiddly, it's very difficult to set up, and it takes a long, long time to render. So really these sorts of things... 
I'd leave alone for the moment. Uh, the same with the focal depth, we can change that in Z depth as well as a lot of this stuff. This is a lot more advanced um, than really where we are at the moment and to be honest with you has a lot to do with um, the depth of field um, that we're talking about up here which to be honest with you I do in post-production so don't worry about those bits and pieces for the moment we've got our cameras and it's a little bit about um, the, the, the settings for them we've also got if I want to manipulate so I'm manipulating the camera here in the perspective view you see and you can see it moving in, in the actual camera view itself but if I select the camera view, you'll notice that down here in the right hand corner, all of these options change. Yeah, so these are my viewport manipulation tools for a perspective view, and then these are those for a camera view. So I've got here something called Dolly Camera. Now, Dolly Camera is where you move the camera in and out. If I left click and hold that, I've got two other options. I can move the target in and out, or I can move both of them in and out. Now I'd be more inclined to keep that option on the bottom one because, and this is important, if I grab hold of the camera here and I move it past that target, look, it's always going to watch the target. So you get to think it flips. Yeah? And you don't necessarily want that happening when you're moving the camera in and out. I might just want to dolly the camera closer to the object there. You see? in which case I want my target to move with me. I've also got this thing here, perspective, so I can change my perspective. And as I do that, what I'm doing is I'm really making this a wider angle lens or a sort of more of a zoom style lens. And I can do that by hand if I really want to. It's the same with the perspective here. I've got a, a, a field of view rather. I can change my field of view. There we go to make it much more wide angle, lower angle for zoom. To be honest, I'd rather stay with the stock footage, uh, with the stock cameras rather. The only other thing that you really need to know is that everything else is here is pretty much the same. We've got orbit instead of rotate. And you can see there I'm orbiting around my camera, or around my object. Well, I've got this other option in here. And what that's going to do is it's going to do just a you can see that we're moving the target of the camera, which is thoroughly confusing because now I've completely lost where my object is. I personally tend to animate in the perspective view and move the camera in the perspective view and then just double check and make sure that everything's okay in the camera view over here. Otherwise you can get yourself into a few problems as you just saw. So do bear that in mind. Um, you've got all the controls down there if you want to use them. Me personally, I'd move stuff in the perspective view, really. It's just going to be a lot easier and a lot less hassle for you. So that's a little bit about cameras themselves. Uh, in the next video, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about camera placement.